like to invite uh, Matt Clark to the floor, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. By contrast, you get an introverted English guy to follow on from, uh, from Susan's slot. Um, I want my best behaviour. When I first got here, Niall took me around here and showed me the bullet holes in the, in the statues. Right there, so I'll do my best. So, um, I'm the commercial director at Nielsen Ireland, and those of you not familiar with Nielsen, uh, we're the largest market research uh, company in the world, operating in 140 countries, including here in Ireland. Um, and in Ireland, we measure two main areas. We measure, on the media side, um, uh, TV audiences. So, we measure, for every TV programme um, that's broadcast in Ireland, we measure how many people watch it and report on that daily to the media industry. And we also measure, on the retail side, particularly focusing on grocery, FMCG retail, um, we measure sales and growth and trends within that area, and that's the main part I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to cover a few different areas. What does the, what does the FMCG grocery um, um, uh, landscape look like in Ireland? Who's winning and losing, and, uh, and where are the growth and what are the trends within that? And then focusing a little bit on the e-commerce um, online shopping element of that, um, of that FMCG landscape. Um, but we've got some comparisons with how that looks here versus the UK, how some of the behaviours are different in Ireland um, as regards grocery online shopping versus the UK, um, and what the, what the shoppers in Ireland say about some of the reasons for and against um, online shopping. Um, and then, obviously, you can't do a presentation nowadays without talking about Brexit, and I've got a couple of slides at the end. Um, think, just looking at some of the impacts we've seen so far of the Brexit vote, particularly looking at cross-border trade with Northern Ireland. So, starting with consumer confidence. So we do a, we do a survey of consumer confidence in Ireland, um, and we've been doing it, as you can see here, back as far as 2006. And a score of 100 on this index is, is around about average, is, is a good sort of confidence score for the industry. Um, so you can see here uh, you know, the, the, the pattern of the Irish industry really over the last 10, 11 years. Um, massively high confidence pre-recession, Celtic Tiger days with those numbers up at um, 117, 118, and then a massive crash um, in, in consumers' confidence in line with what happened to the uh, economy 2008. And really it was three or four years before that moved. So we had an index of around 60, 65 for a long time where things weren't getting better as far as consumers were concerned. And things probably weren't getting better as far as the economy were concerned at that point as well. Um, but since really 2011, 2012, we've seen a slow and steady increase in that consumer confidence um, in line really with all the economic indicators um, from Ireland. So um, the, the growth of employment, decline in unemployment, um, overall um, uh, performance in the Irish economy in comparison with the other countries in Europe. And all of those stories have been good for a long time and steadily improving that consumer confidence as clearly the economy has bounced back. Um, and we're now at a point really of stability. So for the last four, um, three or four quarters, we've had an index around about 9900. So people are, um, are, are much happier with their personal finances, with their job prospects, um, with their ability to spend money, um, but we've kind of reached a period of stability, a sort of plateau. Um, and, and really, I think the first time um, that we've suddenly heard some negativity about the economy was following the Brexit vote, where people are, now there's uncertainty about what will happen, um, you know, whether you're an importer or an exporter or anyone that deals with, them, with foreign markets or currencies, there, there's suddenly a bit of uncertainty, and that's kind of stalled the consumer confidence number. And if you look at this line, we saw, we saw a growth in confidence. There was a lag from there with what that actually turned into consumer spending. So the, the consumers didn't start spending again until these confidence levels got quite high. Um, and what they spent on first were things that they'd really done without for a number of years. So a new car, a holiday, people were very reluctant to suddenly splash the cash that they had in their pockets. And we saw a real lag between that and the growth in the, the grocery spending. Um, which really has only come back to growth in the last year or so. Um, we saw a pattern through the recession where um, the, 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 the discount retailers, Aldi and Lidl in particular, built a lot of stores, opened a lot of stores. People shop there in, in some cases out of necessity. People's budgets weren't going to stretch as far as doing the shopping at expensive retailers. They went to those cheaper retailers and over time realised that actually what they were getting from there 
products that we're getting from there were just as good, if not better, as the more expensive brands that we're buying elsewhere. And the, and the uh, Aldi and Lidl in particular now are very well established. And people aren't going back from those retailers, they've stayed there and therefore kept saving money post-recession. So if we look at the, the overall growth of the, 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 the total FMCG industry, so everything you might buy in a supermarket, um, in total 1.8% value, value growth, and that might not seem like a lot, but a year ago that was um, about 0.2, 0.3, two years ago it was negative, and for three, four years before that it was you know, around about zero um, uh, or, or negative. So we've suddenly got growth back in the industry, and it's driven by a combination of increased volumes, 0.8% more items, more stuff being bought, which again is only like one extra product in, everybody's, uh, in everyone's weekly trolley, but it is one extra product that we weren't seeing previously. Those discretionary items you don't really need, but maybe I'll put an extra one in. Those kind of things are driving that growth. And obviously it's a big market, so 1.8% you know, value growth is, is a big number. And we have got a bit of price inflation in there as well, um, which again, we didn't see for a number of years. So a relatively healthy position for the market um, as a whole. And just to look at how that breaks down, so um, obviously you, you know, all of you, you might not be in the grocery industry, but I dare say you all shop for groceries at some point in the week. Um, so you might recognise where you spend here. So the purple bit on here is the traditional multiples, primarily Tesco, Super Value and Dunn's, biggest part of the market, 46% of the, of the overall market. The blue bit is the discounters, so Aldi and Lidl. Um, 10 years ago that was about 2%, now it's 18% of the market, a very established part of the, the grocery market in Ireland. Um, and the, the orange bit is the convenience market, so garage forecourts, symbol stores, the, you know, the spa based cost cutters of this world, independent grocers, independent off licenses. Um, and we've, we're, the pattern we've got here is one that we've seen for, for quite a few years in the industry. The established multiple retailers are in decline. 0.5% decline at the expense of growth in Aldi and Lidl and now what we've seen over the last year or so, growth in the convenience sector as well. People have got a little bit more, more money to spend, they can afford to shop in convenience stores which tend to be a little bit more expensive. They're still shopping in Aldi and Lidl because the products you get there are great and you get good value for those. Now, how does all this link to e-commerce, you may be asking. Um, we do an estimate for, for the e-commerce section and it's this relatively small sliver here, 0.6% of that market, is, is online shopping. So online shopping accounts for about 3% of Tesco sales and about 1% of super value sales in the grocery world um, in Ireland. Um, as yet, Dunn's, despite having been talking about it for a long time, are not online. Um, and so those online sales are prim uh, primarily coming from Tesco with a little bit from super value. So, a small part of the market, but in quite significant growth, as we'll see. Um, I often get asked, how does it compare with the UK, um, where, which is actually one of the most well-developed um, grocery e-commerce markets in the world. Um, and, and there is quite a difference, and we'll, we'll, I'll talk through perhaps some of the reasons for that. So, Ireland, e-commerce, 0.6% of the market, in around about 10% growth, so significant growth, but obviously from a fairly small base. Um, and that's worth about 90 million um, euros, that sign should say. Um, so, you know, it, it's a big chunk, it's a big market, but given the overall grocery market in Ireland is worth about 15 billion, then obviously that, um, you know, that 0.6% share is a decent amount. Um, in the UK, much more developed, much bigger, and a different model really, a different um, way of shopping for a number of people. So around about 6% of the market is, is online. Tesco Online has been around in the UK for a long time. Um, and they're the number one player still, about 40% of that, followed by Sainsbury's and Asda in the UK. 4.85% um, growth roughly for, that, for that, that, that sector of the market. And that's worth nearly 7 billion. So obviously a big, big market in the UK, big proportion of that. I think, I think there are some interesting comparisons between the UK and Ireland. Um, one of the uh, online grocery shopping is always a balance between the benefits it gives you versus some of the challenges and some of the reasons why not. One of the massive differences with the UK uh, versus Ireland is the massive urban centres. So London, um, Birmingham, Manchester to a lesser extent. A lot, of people there, uh, a lot of people there don't have cars and therefore get to a supermarket Getting all your shopping home on the tube or the bus or whatever is a massive uh, inconvenience. And on, you know, doing your online shopping is a massive benefit for you. And you'll pay extra for that, for the, for the, the convenience of that. 
In Ireland, you know, obviously Dublin is dominant, but still the majority of people will drive past the supermarket on the way home or drive very close to one. In which case, actually, the, the getting the stuff home is not so much of a big deal um, and not so much of a driver. And I think that's one of the one of the key things. Where I don't think the Ireland model, as it currently stands, is going to get to six percent like we have in the UK. But probably that 0.6% can get to one, one and a half percent over the next three or four years, particularly if Dunn's come online as well um, within the current model. Um, so quite big differences if you if you think about the way the way people shop. So in, in Ireland, um, the chart on the left here, um, only 23% of shoppers actually visited a retailer's website, a grocery retailer's website um, in a given month. And only 25% of them only bought, uh, actually bought something. So around about a quarter of people go to the site and around about a quarter of them actually buying something, which gives us only 6% of shoppers are actually buying something online um, in the grocery sector. Um, in the UK, um, over a third of shoppers are visiting a site and 60% of them are buying something. So more people and also a much bigger proportion of them are going there to actually buy um, some, um, some products online. Remember, this is only grocery shopping, so the, the other sectors that are, that are not um, through your, your mainstream supermarkets wouldn't be covered in these numbers. Um, and why not? So we're, maybe a slightly negative question, but what are the big barriers, we ask shoppers, why wouldn't you buy your, your grocery shopping online? And in kind of diminishing order, on the left-hand side, the biggest, biggest reasons why not, it costs more. Um, I, I'm concerned that they're not going to put the products in my basket that I would have put in and I want to see the products myself, I actually like going around the store. And um, those kind of real, actually quite emotional reasons why people do like to shop um, in person rather than um, have someone else do it for them. Secondary reasons, you might not feel like you see the offers and the deals um, online as you would so easily if you were in the store, um, and things like delivery times and getting the right products um, sent to you. So you know, if you think about the grocery online shopping model right now, um, you, you can only really buy what's in your local store um, because the, 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 the websites are set up that your the products come from your local store. You, um, you pay the same prices as if, if you were in the local store and maybe even it's a little bit harder to find some of those deals and discounts. Um, you have to be in when they deliver it and they can't just leave it on your doorstep going cold or going warm or whichever way around the, the, the products are. So there are reasons, uh, and you may have to pay for the delivery. So in order to balance all of that, there needs to be some really compelling reasons that, that it works for you in terms of time or convenience and all of those factors with that, with that current model. So, you know, it's here, it's there to stay, but in Ireland right now it's a relatively small um, part of the market. And, and one I think that, that is right for development from the retailer's point of view, what can they do more to develop the, the online offer? And also for the manufacturers working with those retailers, how can they make their online um, offers and their online um, um, the, the, the sites, the information on the sites and how they, how they do their online marketing, how can they make that more compelling uh, to the Irish shopper? So we, we know that a big chunk of Irish shoppers are actually going onto retailer websites, but very few of them are actually buying anything. So what are they doing? 71% of them are just going on there to look for the special offers. Um, and the, the retailers are very well geared up to making that easy for people. Um, we know that most shoppers in Ireland will shop in three or four different retailers um, in a given monthly period. People are used to shopping around, used to looking for the best deals, um, and the retailer websites very much help them find that. Um, and uh, by far the number two on here is, is the actual buy, uh, buying the groceries online piece. And if we look at the retailer websites which people most commonly visit, then Number uh, one is Lidl, followed by Aldi, followed by Dunn's, none of whom have online shopping. Um, and Tesco, who are the biggest online shopper, uh, are number four in there. So people are very, very geared up for going on the retailer websites on a regular basis, looking for the information that's there. But they're, they're doing it as an information gathering exercise, much more so than they are a, a shopping exercise at this point. So given that people are on the sites, big opportunity to, to drive um, some more of that conversion into shopping. Um, if the retailers and manufacturers can get that right. I just pulled out a few examples of what that does actually look like. I mean, you, you, you probably do this yourself if you're in the majority, as we've seen on the, um, on the previous numbers. It's very easy to get to this information. So just an example of Lidl. Um, the, the Aldi pictures look very similar, as you can imagine. Um, big, big banner on their site on 
the, the offers of the week, this one is wine, you can scroll to the right and left and you know they, they talk about their fruit and veg offers, um, big promotional offers, very easy to see. You know, is it worth, worth my while driving to a little based on these offers? Um, it, it's the question that a lot of those people are asking themselves. And they also have a very close link to their, um, their specials aisle where the products change every week. And people we know do go on to these sites on a regular basis to see what is going to be on offer there the next week, given that the products in that specials aisle change every week. So um, this week coming is fitness gear, the week after that it's the garden, um, you know, and, the, and then we'll be on to chainsaws and all the other kind of weird and wonderful stuff they sell down there. So really publicising their special deals, um, but also the day-to-day the -day grocery offers that you see in store. And all the retailer websites do that to a greater or lesser extent. And just for example, again, Super Value doing exactly the same thing um, with slightly better pictures. Um, but you know, the, the, their deals of the week, their deals of the month, um, advertising or talking about their marketing initiatives, so the Good Food Karma project um, they're talking about here. And one of the quite neat things that they do on the Super Value website is share that there's a recipe section, and you can link very quickly to that from that to putting the items for that um, particular recipe into your online basket and making it easy. So there's an example of five of the ingredients you can buy that go into this two ingredient pancake um, picture <laughs> that I found on the secret. There are more below the screen that wouldn't fit on. Um, but to uh, make it very easy, you just click on that straight in your basket if you like the, the look of that recipe. So, so the, the, you know, the retailers are trying to link uh, the, the online presence to the online shopping piece. Um, but as yet, I think it's pretty underdeveloped um, and you know, lots of opportunities for the retailers and manufacturers to, to, uh, to grow in that area. Um, so, <laughs> I'm not going to stand here and predict what's going to happen with Brexit um, or, or take responsibility, although I feel like I ought to apologise every now and again. Um, what we've tried to do with Brexit, clearly the, there's, a, there's a lot to go in terms of what it's actually going to mean in reality um, when all the negotiations are said and done. But since the vote, by far the, the biggest impact has been the currency change, which happened virtually overnight and, and, and stayed. Um, a, 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 a new level really throughout the second half of 2016. So what we try to measure is, um, has that had an impact on cross-border shopping? Um, you know, and obviously nowadays, uh, in, in our modern e-commerce world, it's very easy to compare prices from your local Tesco or local, local Super Value online with what a Tesco in, um, in the north would be, or a Sainsbury's if you want some variety. Um, and also then if you're in the market for a TV or an Xbox or a, a, an iPad or whatever it may be, very easy to research prices cross border. Um, and what we tend to see is a lot less uh, uh, cross border shopping happening in reality than what people say they might do. And people very readily in research say, yes, I'll definitely go and shop cross border. We, we saw a lot less of it actually happen. But we did have a go at trying to, trying to measure what the actual impact was on grocery sales. So, so just a couple of charts looking at that. We, we, we looked at the growth um, in the Christmas period, so November, December 2016. Um, the Republic of Ireland grocery market grew by 2% year on year. The UK mainland grocery market grew by 1.4% and Northern Ireland grew by, by 5.5%. So quite, uh, quite a significant difference there in, in the grocery market in Northern Ireland, which indicates that there was you know, trolleys being stopped up, car boots being stopped up in the lead up to Christmas um, as people were, were going over the border uh, and shopping. And if we look at the growth picture um, pre-Brexit, Northern Ireland in orange was worth, if you take the island of Ireland as a total, Northern Ireland was worth 37.7% of that. That went up at its peak in October to 39% and dropped back a bit in December. So I think the picture we've seen here is um, People can research prices and you know leading up to Christmas you're going to need to stock up on various things so you, you, might, you might be quite willing to fill up your, your car boot with wine or beer or spirits or whatever that you know you can get cheaper, particularly if you know also you're going to save a few hundred quid on uh, a new TV or a big ticket item or, or you know, some, of those, uh, some of those more expensive items you might buy for Christmas. And it's a day out and you know, that you'll save a bit more money than you spend on your petrol unless you live all the way down south and, and you know it, it was a thing that people were talking about particularly in the back end of the year and we definitely saw an impact there on you know, growth in the grocery market in the north um, and slow down in the growth um, down here but I think by the time we got close to Christmas then people people's time outweighs their ability to go and do that so you know the last month leading up to Christmas actually 
but not many people have actually got all day to drive up north and do all of that stuff. So we saw a lot of stocking up pre-Christmas, a bit less right in the, in the crunch when people were doing their big Christmas shopping. And I think now, settling down post-Christmas um, for, the, for the bulk of this year, I think we'll, we'll see things drop back to normal. If the exchange rates stay where they are, it might be the, the kind of trip that people do um, in October, November this year. But I don't think we've see, we'll see a, a, a permanent shift in, in sales across the border um, based on uh, the, the exchange rates as they are. So that, that's kind of what we're seeing. We'll obviously keep an eye on it and um, you know, those of you that are interested, we can keep you uh, updated on that. So, so what next in terms of Brexit? Clearly we need to understand um, where the negotiations end up, what happens with the border is one obviously big question, um, what happens with all those trade agreements is going to have a massive impact. Uh, you know, we can measure the, 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 the shoppers and the consumers in Ireland, what they're doing, um, and you know, each of you in the room will be impacted in a different way by the actual, uh, by the actual Brexit impact. And when we actually know more about the, the, the reality of that, then that's the kind of thing we can start researching. In terms of online shopping, I think with the, the grocery online shopping model as it stands, where the retailers, if you, if you order something from a retailer, they've got someone going around the store picking all the products for you, they've got someone in a van bringing them to your house, actually costs the retailer 15, 20 euros per transaction to serve that in, uh, stuff to you. So it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a low margin job for the retailers compared to if you go and do all the hard work yourself. Um, and with those reasons why you need to be you need to be in the house when it's delivered, it might cost you a little bit more. I think that 0.6% share might go up to 1% in the next year or two, um, but we're a long way off to get to that 6% share that we see um, in the UK under that current model. And, and you know, I, I'm not going to predict future models, but you know, if, if something came along to disrupt that, if there were changes to how that works, then we can see some bigger increases. But I think on the grocery side, that's probably where we'll be for the next uh, next year or two. I'm very happy to take questions, if there are any. Hi. Sorry, just in terms of what you were just saying there about the UK, the 6% versus the government. Sorry. Um, if you don't mind repeating. Sorry. But, uh, don't they have the same challenges there? I know you get one reason where you're talking about the large urban areas, but I mean, they have to be in to kind of to Yeah, the, the, the model, you're right, the, the model is exactly the same. As, as it is there. I, I think the urbanisation thing is, is a big thing. I think, you know, the, in, outside, of the, outside of the major cities, I think the, the share of online is much, much lower. So, for the, for okay, so, you, so that's what you basically account for the difference? Yeah, so the, 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 the main reason, yes, is that urbanisation piece. But secondly, it's been around for longer and been, been more established for longer, so it's a little bit further up on the growth curve. Yeah. Thanks. Just, uh, you mentioned it's kind of an underdeveloped market as well as in Ireland for this. Do you think there's possibly space for a more pure play, e-commerce only, online browser? And could they get around some of the, the kind of problems that the, the more traditional retailers have? Yeah, good question. So in the UK, um, the, the, the standalone e-commerce um, supplier is Ocado. They, they source from a number of different supermarkets. They still have the same, challenge, same cost challenges in that they've got to put stuff in a van and drive it to you and can consolidate all the stock and so on. Um, so, and they're sourcing the products largely from those same warehouses. I think, I think there's a model where um, for certain products, for certain brands, the manufacturers are going direct. So you know, the likes of um, Dollar Shave Club and subscription services for, for, for razors and so on. Um, is, is creeping in. The, the big challenge in the industry is the big manufacturers uh, work alongside the big retailers and are not willing or able to go off and do it all themselves because they need the retailers for the other part of the business. So I, I, I would say in Ireland there, there, are, there are lots of opportunities for, for smaller pure play online um, uh, providers. Perhaps not one big one that does the whole basket shop but, but more of the, you know, there's more profitability I think in, in the, you know, lots of smaller deliveries than there is in fewer bigger deliveries I've seen now. 